Hello, everyone. My name is Janine Donnelly. I'm the manager of webinars for IBM Systems Magazine. And on behalf of IBM Systems Magazine, I'd like to welcome you to our presentation. Today's webinar, True Mainframe Automated Unit Testing, is sponsored by CompuWare. Our featured speakers today are Glenn Everett, Randy Rice, and Stephen Kanza. Glenn joined CompuWare through a startup acquisition, serving as chief architect for the startup's core application. Glenn has architected products for mobile, Windows, Linux, and mainframe platforms. He currently works on product strategy and its technical feasibility. Randy Rice founded Rice Consulting in 1990. He is a leading author, speaker, consultant, and practitioner in the field of software testing and software quality. He has over 40 years of experience in building and testing software projects in a variety of environments with deep experience in mainframe systems as both a developer and tester. Steve Kanza is Principal Product Manager for Topaz Workbench and ISPW. Steve has extensive experience in agile application development and DevOps across a wide variety of technologies and industries. So without further ado, Steve, I'll turn the presentation over to you. Thanks, Janine, and very happy to be able to join everyone on the call today. To help inspire you, we wanted to share our favorite bugs. So my personal favorite bug is I, I have to admit I was a, a Windows Phone user, and I ran into a, a rare scenario. I like to hack around a little bit in terms of some of my devices. And I ran into a scenario on Windows Phone where my phone was actually asking for an install uh, disk because the phone was based on, on Windows. So that was a, a particularly surprising and uh, pretty embarrassing thing to have happen to my phone. Randy, do you want to speak to yours? Yes, Steve, I sure will. Yeah, that's a pretty good one. Um, they don't have disk drives on those phones, do they? Um, so mine goes back to one of my early days in coding, and it, I'm going to be dating myself pretty well here, but this was in the days where we were sharing monitors between a team of about 12 people. And anyway, I was struggling over this one section of code, some if statements, and I would compile the code and run my test, and still it just appeared like the, the if statement, the else was not catching. I looked back at my code, but there was a period uh, in the right position in the if statement, and I showed it to my manager. He looked at it. He couldn't see anything wrong with it. We recompiled, tried it again, still no problem. I was still uh, same results. The thing that had happened was that our company had installed um, at that time a new kind of printer. It was a Xerox photostatic printer. It uh, was a precursor to the laser printers, but it functioned a little bit differently. It would put you know, physical ink there on the paper in a different way. So as I was struggling over this code, I just happened to turn the page of the printout. And like I say, I didn't look at it on a monitor because we were sharing monitors. So I turned the page, and it happened to be kind of a blank page. And I noticed right in the middle of the page there was a dot. So I thought, hmm, that's weird. Turn the other page after that. On the next page, there was a dot, the same relative position on the paper. I go back to the page my if statement was on that was giving me problems, and the dot appeared right at the end of the else that I was struggling with. So the period, in fact, was not in the code, but it was on the printout. And I, you, you can argue if that was a bug or not, but, but to me, that's one of the wildest problems I ever had to work through as a programmer. So my favorite, <clears throat> excuse me, this is Glenn. My favorite bug was uh, the Mariner space probe was lost. That was a, an $18.5 million space probe back in 62. Uh, it was programmed with Fortran. And it was a single character, a dot instead of a comma, that caused the navigation system to foul up. And basically, they, <clears throat> they had to blow the thing up without ever getting any use for it. And I think why that I found that so fascinating was a single character, and it was a very good lesson in knowing that software is just absolutely unforgiving in a lot of cases. So you need to be 
really conscientious about doing your testing or you know a single character can blow up your eighteen and a half million dollar uh, probe and uh, you know remove a little bit of national pride you had in that probe anyhow that was mine so with that let's go and start uh, getting into the core of the presentation here so this particular uh, diagram shows us the, our DevOps infinity loop, and it represents a program lifecycle. Copyware continues to create more and more sophisticated DevOps pipelines with our large Fortune 100 companies. We believe the most important aspect of DevOps is maintaining quality at speed. So it's not just good enough to go faster. You actually have to maintain that high level of quality that people expect on a mainframe. If we think of that high degree of automation around unit and functional testing required to maintain those high levels of quality. Uh, and also that speed of delivery. The other key aspect of the DevOps pipeline is the ease of adding new tooling, uh, and CompuWare's partnered with a lot of companies and other vendors to actually enhance uh, the capabilities of DevOps pipelines for our customers. And it also helps us ensure that you know we have shifted left the, the, all these quality processes and automated that in uh, in this at the same time frame. So uh, with that, I think we're going to go over and we'll start with Randy's presentation. And Randy, take it away. Okay, thanks, Glenn. Well, uh, Janine gave me a, a basic intro, which was uh, very good. Uh, so I'll just mention here that um, I have co-authored a couple of books, uh, Surviving the Top Ten Challenges of Software Testing, that focuses a lot on the people issues in testing. Uh, one of those being the throw it over the wall syndrome between developers and testers. The other one being testing dirty systems, which uh, both of these I co-wrote with Bill Perry. And we learned, especially back during Y2K time, uh, that there are just a huge number of companies that struggle with systems that have been written, but you know just maintained patched over patch. So we wrote this book as a process book uh, around how to maybe get a grip on that. And of course, a lot of it boils down to the code itself. So uh, I am on the board of directors of the American Software Testing Qualifications Board. Some of you may be familiar with that if you're into uh, testing certification. And uh, I do have my own consulting uh, and training organization that we do training in unit testing. And in fact, the first course I ever wrote was for a unit testing in the company that I was working at as a QA manager at the time before I got into Rice Consulting. So to kind of level set here, uh, let's just kind of put out a real quick definition about unit testing. Uh, it's kind of interesting. There is an IEEE standard, uh, and I believe that's been uh, now incorporated into the ISO standard on testing. But uh, at one point, there was a standard on unit testing, and even in that standard, they said that there is no uh, consensus about really what comprises a unit. So I typically describe it as the testing that you do on the smallest thing that you can uh, access, the smallest testable parts of an application. You do that uh, individually and independently so you can kind of isolate what may be working or not working w within that component. You may want to think of it as a kind of a component view of things. Now, this includes not only testing uh, the code, uh, but also testing things like detail functionality, edits, error messages, things like that. Uh, one thing that's also helpful is to kind of look at the what unit testing is not. Uh, I've encountered some developers who felt like just getting a clean compile was their unit test. And no, that is just getting a clean compile that is not test for any kind of bugs or defects or anything. Uh, it's also not just showing that your code works correctly. I used to do that all the time. And my, my user would come in and do something crazy, uh, like press the enter key with no data on the screen, and my unit would would crash. <laughs> and so it's not just a proof of correctness either. And it's not just handing it off to a user to ask them to perform some tests either. So unit testing is a, uh, can be a, a very time-consuming thing for people, at least traditionally. And what you're going to see in this w webinar today, I think, will be an exciting advance forward from that kind of tedious world. Now, I just kind of want to run through some best practices real quickly here. And I 
I'm going to address some of these in a bit more detail as we uh, go through this very first part of the webinar. But uh, first of all, in unit testing, we need to test both the structure of the code as well as the functionality of that code. Sometimes we, uh, you know, if you're a developer, you kind of think about, well, let me just test the calculations, let me test the edits and those kind of things, but don't really get into decision testing and that kind of thing. Also, there's a real value in doing this testing early and keeping it up uh, because what you want to do is find the defects as quickly as you can to keep them from escaping later into a life cycle. It's also good to measure and understand the coverage that you've achieved in your test. Uh, typically, I think about structural coverage, which we'll talk about here, but it could also be functional coverage, and it could also be coverage of things like user stories or requirements or things like that. Now, getting into the tooling aspect, one of the things is that we really have to know what it is that we need to test at the unit level and what makes sense to automate. Uh, you know, it doesn't do a lot of good to automate a lot of trivial things if they don't have value into your test. And then you also want to make this um, testing that you do that you've invested in uh, reusable. And so you can reuse those tests not only for unit testing, but integration into your uh, DevOps tool chain and using the automated framework and get additional value out of that. And the final one is that it, when it comes to unit testing, most people that I encounter are used to the kind of open source world, the the, the J unit tools and uh, in unit and those kind of tools in the distributed environments, where you actually have to spend a lot of manual time in creating your test. And when I do training on that, the people say, and this is helpful, how? Uh, because it really doesn't give them a lot of leverage when it takes a lot of time to develop the automation. So if we can come up with some tools, which you'll see coming up actually, is that we can actually use the automated approach to create the test that we want to perform, and that way you avoid this issue of test fatigue where you just simply get tired of either creating your test or running your test. So that's what we're kind of going to kind of look at here. Now, I'm, I'm going to go through a few uh, unit testing uh, challenges and constraints here, and just to kind of not paint a negative picture, but to kind of paint what people go through that I've observed in, in, in my training and consulting. First of all, uh, there's a, a lack of several things, uh, one being time. Uh, uh, if you talk to a lot of developers, they'll say, gee, you know, I'd like to do better unit testing, but, you know, I've got a deadline looming and I just don't have time to do it. I've got to get the work that, out the door. Also, there's a lack of tools, and this has been especially the case in the mainframe environment. Most of the unit testing tools that have emerged uh, over the last 15, 20 years or so, uh, they've been more oriented toward Java and C++ and, and those kind of languages, but not a lot uh, in unit, I mean in, uh, in mainframe. And also, there's many times a lack in even how to do unit testing. A lot of developers, they get training in dev techniques, but not necessarily how to do things like decision testing and multi-decision testing and those kinds of things. And then one of the big uh, issues that we have especially, this is what we talk about in the Testing Dirty Systems book, is how do you know what is correct behavior? Uh, if any of you are maintenance programmers, then you understand what I'm saying here because sometimes it takes days pouring over code just to understand how it's supposed to behave, and the, even then, uh, you may not be exactly certain. And that also relates to the specifications or knowledge that we may not have. And even if those specs are in place, perhaps they're old, they haven't been maintained, or the person with the knowledge has left the company. That, that's a, a really common one. Uh, one thing also I see is an over-reliance on independent testers where a developer, they'll write their code, they will do maybe some minimal test on it, throw it over to the test team if there's a test team. If you're on an agile team, you throw it over to your agile person uh, that's testing. And there's kind of this back and forth that happens. Uh, the, the tester finds something, they throw it back to the developer, and it starts to resemble a ping pong game. It's highly inefficient. And the final thing here is 
just a, an absence of management making the message to developers that testing is part of the job. Um, it's not just something that you can hand off to someone else. One reason in particular is because the developers, I'm sorry, the, the testers just don't have the same expertise in the code as a developer would have. So th those are the things that I see. Now I'm going to ask my co-presenters here if they want to uh, add some of their perspective onto this slide. Sure, Randy, this is Glenn. Um, when we were doing research for Topaz for Total Test, what we discovered is almost all of our mainframe people that we were talking to were doing manual unit tests. And honestly, that, that we came uh, away from that uh, result quite surprised because we expected, you know, these programs are 30 and 40 years old that you would have thought there would be some automated testing associated with them. Um, sometimes we'd encounter a customer who had home built a system and ran that for a while, but it fell into disuse uh, as the people who maintain those, uh, those automated systems went away. Um, so it's, it was really quite interesting that the, the level of automation is so low in the mainframe marketplace. Thanks, Glenn, and I would concur. Uh, I, I would say that, that most of what I see is, is typically manual as well. Well, uh, let's look at some of the risk if we don't do unit testing. And I think when we look at it from a risk perspective, it, it helps us see the real value of unit testing. One of the biggest risks is that any of the defects that we could have found in unit testing, but if they kind of go downstream into later parts of the project, even in Agile, even in a highly iterative life cycle, the things that we could have found in in unit testing appearing later on can have an extremely high cost. And if it, if it goes on into production, then that's kind of like the worst case uh, scenario. That's when the cost really increases, as we'll see here. Also, this back and forth between testers and developers, as I mentioned earlier, is just a highly inefficient way to uh, do development and testing because it just takes so much time, and time is the thing that we really don't have in some of these accelerated DevOps uh, pipelines that we uh, that we see so often now. And uh, one of the other major uh, risk with lack of unit testing is that you wind up with applications that are unstable. They may have performance problems. They may have security vulnerabilities. Uh, the thing that a lot of people don't fully uh, realize or embrace is that performance problems and security vulnerabilities all kind of stem from basic defects that uh, start to appear in ways other than we would expect. Uh, th there was a major performance problem uh, with NASDAQ during the Facebook IPO uh, back around, I, I believe it was 2012, but um, it was three lines of code, I believe, got into a tight loop on that deal. And uh, it was easy to fix the problem, but the ramifications of it was huge. Last I checked, the it had cost over $80 million in terms of fines and a restitution that had to be paid. Um, Guys, you, have you seen any other risk or any perspective on this also? Yeah, Randy, this is Glenn again. We, you know, we deal with a lot of financial companies and healthcare companies, and both of them have expectations from government agencies that this data be accurate and protected. And so it's often, you know, we often get told that there's there's penalties if they don't actually meet the letter of the law and their calculations. So they're very concerned about making sure that their code is a. a you know, high quality and actually all the calculations are correct. Yeah, good, good point, Glenn. Uh, and of course, that gets right down to the uh, to the correctness of the code, to the decisions, to the things that you'll probably never see in the user interface perspective. Now, there's a uh, uh, thanks for that comment, by the way, Glenn. Uh, now, now, there's a dynamic that's been studied for many, many years. It's, it's called the 110-100 rule, uh, but I show it in this chart here as basically the idea here is that a defect that you would find in fixing requirements, let's say that that's a one-time multiplier. Same thing with design. 
you get it into code. Uh, if you are dealing with that defect at that time, it costs you about five times to fix it there as it would early on. You get into the test phase, it costs about 10 times, and in production, 100 times or more. Now, you'll see on the left-hand side there uh, of the chart, the, the, the y-axis, that it's a uh, dollar amount. And that's typically how you'll see this uh, cost expressed. But uh, actually, you know, it's even a multiplier of those dollars because you're not going to fix a requirements defect for a dollar, obviously. But it's the, the multiplier that we need to be looking at. And you can see, of course, the big increase comes once you go into uh, production. And as I said, th this information uh, is current, and this reflects the last 17 years of being in kind of a predominantly agile direction in, uh, in software development. So uh, I've been kind of negative <laughs> for a little bit. Let's look at the bright side and some of the opportunities that we have because this is the value-added method that we can see in, uh, in unit testing. First of all, uh, you get a, a much better understanding of your code, and this is essential if you're really going to do good testing, especially of existing systems. And as we see, we have the cost and time savings from finding defects earlier in our life cycle. And the increased code stability pays big dividends, uh, both in performance, security, even usability, and other aspects of, of using the application. So there's some real benefits there. And uh, keep in mind, too, that a lot of other people are depending upon the quality of what an individual developer may be doing. So just to have a cleaner build and not to break the build uh, at some point during the day can also be a, a big time saving and efficiency benefit. But ultimately, what we want to see here and what we do see in organizations that do have automation in place and that they're making the best of it is that they can do faster, more meaningful testing at and when I say at higher levels, I, I mean they're able to do it at a way that's not trivial, and they're able to really add some value in, in what they do there. Now, before I go to the next slide, um, I'm going to uh, take a breath here and, <laughs> and see what my co-presenters have to add. Andy, this is Glenn again. You know, what we find interesting is the fact that, you know, the customers, we have a couple early adopters with unit testing on the mainframe, and what they've said is it helps the entire life cycle just go much more smoothly. And in particular, one thing that, they, that stood out to me was they were very excited about their uh, user acceptance testing, which usually ran over a couple of weekends. They were so excited because it only took them one weekend rather than three weekends to get through their acceptance testing. When they set, stood took a step back and analyzed why that was, it was because they found so many more bugs earlier in the process through their unit testing. And so they're big believers in unit testing now because it saves them a couple of weekends. Thanks so much, Glenn, and I can concur with that. I've had uh, clients come back and tell me several uh, months and years later that, wow, the effect of what we did saved them multiple cycles of testing, and those multiple cycles of testing are very expensive. As you said, it can represent an entire weekend. So there's some tangible benefit here. So whenever I talk about tooling and anything like that, I, I have to talk about that this is not just a, a one-sided thing, okay? It's not just about the tools. It's about process, and it's about people as well. And unless you can keep all of these in balance, uh, having a good process that you can apply the tools with, and also having people that are trained and motivated, uh, you're not going to see the results that you would uh, hope to see out of the tools. Now, the reality is is that you know many people do go around with maybe one or two sides, and in fact, sometimes even three sides of the triangle missing. But just to keep in mind, there's kind of a holistic view of this. And there's also something to understand, too. Um, I'm calling it the tool gap here. And it's the difference between just owning a tool and being able to intelligently apply it um, and having it integrated into your process of, of actually using it for your day-to-day your -day work and uh, being a benefit to you. The, the pictures that you see, uh, the guy mowing the lawn and the guy painting the wall, a couple of real quick analogies here. When, when I first got a riding lawnmower, uh, you know, I've been mowing my lawn by a, a, a push-behind mower, and I had a rather large lawn, so I was really excited. I had a riding lawnmower. 
the first time I used it, I looked back and I had totally butchered my lawn. <laughs> and it's because I didn't understand things about the blades had to be adjusted, the tire pressures had to be right, the, there's a pattern to mow with. And it took me two or three attempts to do that. So the, the tool being the mower in that case, yes, I did it much faster, but it looked much worse at first until I learned some of the nuances around using that. Same thing with painting. You know, you would think, oh, okay, I'm going to start on something small. But if you start on, like, cabinets, it, it's very difficult because you have to hit all these little tiny corners. And so, you know, you want to start on something simple. And that's where we get into the idea of understanding which situations are actually best for test automation. Uh, I advise people to start with simple things before the most complex and then kind of work up from there. But this is where the training comes in, is to kind of help you understand where those areas are. And then a really big thing that people tend to overlook is I've got to maintain this stuff. As my applications change, as my uh, even the tool itself may undergo uh, uh, versions, uh, I have to be able to maintain what I'm creating, like the test scripts and the test cases and, and those kinds of things. So uh, it, it's important to understand that just getting the tool is step one. Uh, beyond that, then you have some bigger questions to ask and answer. Now, one thing that I typically cover in training is that th there are various levels of coverage. Uh, a lot of times a, a developer or development manager will say, hey, we've covered 100% of our lines of code. And I say, that's great, but well, what about all the branches? What about the, what all the true-false decisions? And um, then the discussion takes a little bit different turn because, oh, yeah, we need to do that. And just because you've tested all the statements doesn't mean you've tested all the decisions, depending upon how the code is written. And then there's even higher levels, as we see here, like condition coverage, multi-condition coverage, and eventually path coverage, which will cover all the ways to traverse the code that you're testing. Now, the, the road ahead here, the thing that we know is that the development life cycles and delivery methods are requiring uh, us to work more iteratively, more uh, fast-paced, and so testing has to keep up with that. And the mantra that I hear most often is, it's faster, better, more. And that is almost impossible to do without doing automated testing. So where in the past we've been able to get by with manual testing just by working harder, okay, that's not quite what is going to be sustainable going into the future. We're going to have to get a grip on how to automate some of our tests. Now, I want to take a, another break here to see if my co-presenters have any thoughts they want to add in at this point. Yeah, Randy, I think we'll just jump in here to the best practices in unit testing. And this is kind of a review of what you mentioned earlier. But now uh, I just wanted to start to introduce uh, Steve Kanz. He's going to talk uh, and do some demonstration about uh, our Topaz or Total Test Tool. And we're going to kind of try to show you what the tool can do to help you with the, the kind of those best practices steps that you've laid out for us. Take it away, please. Sure. Thanks, Glenn. And I'm going to uh, start off this, this demo showing um, Topaz Workbench. And Topaz Workbench brings together a lot of the, the Topaz and ISPW functionality. And we're going to focus in on the, the testing aspect for this webinar. And Randy mentioned one of the things that you need to understand uh, in your, your testing, and you want to shift that testing to the left, meaning it's close to the point of uh, development as you possibly can. And he said, you know, one of the things that resonated with me is you need to adequately understand the structure of what you want to test. And I'll, I'll show how that can be done with Topaz Workbench. So what I'm showing here is I've run through, and I so I, I'm going to take the role of a developer that's been assigned to modify a, a batch application. And what I'm showing here is I've run that batch application, and I'm showing our runtime visualizer, uh, which is part of our Topaz uh, program analysis functionality. And th in this case, this is a fairly simple structure. Some of our, our customers have really, really large uh, visualizations because they have larger, more complex applications. And 
for example, I know one of our customers, they had a batch application, and every time they wanted to make a change, they needed to run through their full batch cycle. And that process took a full 14 hours to execute. So that in that type of situation, it's very difficult for you to be able to shift that testing forward and shift it earlier in the process. So in this large batch application, I know as a developer what I've really uh, – what I've modified, what I need to modify to complete um, the, the assignment that I was given was modifying this particular application, but it's down pretty far in this chain of different program calls. So what I'm going to show you is how we can use Topaz for total tests to, to make this a much easier uh, process. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and re-execute this. And this time, what I'm going to, to do is I'm going to show um, this, this execution, and I am going to show um, during this execution what, uh, what um, I'm, I want to jump in and I want to just focus on one particular program, that program I'm interested in, so CW... BW Cobb X, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to set a breakpoint in that uh, in that program, and I'll go ahead and start executing again. And now I'm in that particular program right at the the main procedure. And what I want to do is I want to create a unit test for this program. So we're going to walk through the process of creating a unit test. Once this test is created it can be reused for future developers and enabling that, that automation and closing that gap that, uh, that we recognize that many of our customers had where they didn't have an automated test asset built up. So um, I'm going to ask Glenn to talk a little bit about some of these capabilities we have in generating this unit test. Sure, Steve. You could go ahead and create the test project, and we'll talk a little bit about these features uh, on, the, uh, on this panel here. So as you notice, there's a couple different checkboxes here for IMS and VSAM. So what we're doing with those is that's a way that you can automatically create stubs so that you can stub out particular files that are used in your program. This makes it dramatically easier to move your program around and test it in isolation uh, from those files. As well as you see, there's an option there for DB2 SQL stubs and IMS stubs. So if you have either DB2 or IMS, we can sub those calls out so you can isolate your program from them. And that makes it much easier to deal with not only executing that, but having a lot more systems that you can test on because you, you're not required to have DB2 or IMS subsystems at that point. So that's all I wanted to say, Steve. Thanks, Glenn. So I'm going to go ahead and um, I've set up to capture my unit test, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn off the breakpoint because this program, if you recall from our runtime visualization, is called multiple times. And I'm going to go ahead and, and kick off uh, this again, and we can see here now what's happening is the program is executing. And as it's executing, you can see that it's reading a lot um, from various files. It's writing to files. It interacts with uh, some, some sub-programs. So you can see these two sub-programs. So now that the execution is complete, what I'm going to do is I'll, I'll go back and look at this unit test project that was generated from it. So what total test has done is it is captured all that interaction the program did with the, the two files that it was reading and writing from, and also those two sub-programs. So, Glenn, uh, maybe this is a good time to talk a little bit about some of the, the concepts in total tests. Sure. So what we're looking at now is the test scenario, and the test scenario is, provides the parameters into the program under test. So you see the values that we actually captured live while the, the program was executing. And, Steve, if you click on that stubs menu, we'll see what the stubs that were actually generated for the program. 
you see on the right-hand box that's highlighted in blue, we, out, we created uh, four different stubs, two sub-program stubs. So again, we can isolate the main program from sub-programs that it actually calls, as well as two files, the input file, the employee read file, and the report file, the report that's actually, or the file that's actually written the report to. So, and if we look down below there, if you click under the stubs and click on, for example, the employee read stub, uh, we can see the data that was actually captured by the program. This is a huge time savings in automatically gathering data and presenting that in this nice stub. The other thing you can do with this, and I think you're going to show this a little bit later, is editing that data. Finally, let's double click on the right stub and open that up because I just wanted to talk to one more item there. And that is the, the we have the, the concept, and if you could select maybe record 14 for me, please, Steve. Because what I wanted to show is that we provide a level of assertion. So whenever this data is written out to a file, we validate that the data values that are being written out to that file are actually the values that we are expecting. Now, we get those expected values from that data collection process that we went through initially. But if you think those are not the correct data values from the original program, you can go in and obviously edit those and change the assertion levels. But anyhow, I just wanted to do a, a quick little overview of, you know, kind of the pieces of that and let you know that those stubs are really for making it simpler to manage your program by isolating out other things that you don't necessarily care about uh, uh, running. So, Steve, uh, why don't we continue on? Yeah, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go and, and execute this unit test. So let's say I've made some changes to this program. And now I want to make sure that I, uh, I'm, I'm testing those changes thoroughly. So I'll go ahead and execute it. And in this case, I'm going to use the stubs that I generated and um, run the program with those stubs. So again, if we, if we think back to that runtime visualization, I'm going to run this program but I don't need to go through that, that full larger execution chain. I can just execute that individual program and use the stubbed data values that were captured as input into that program. So I don't need to worry about orchestrating, if we look at this, this large uh, chain of applications, orchestrating all the data across all these programs um, in, in various files to, to execute this and have, have to possibly worry that, you know, one of my coworkers is modifying uh, this program and when I try to execute and test my program, maybe something's, uh, you know, they're not quite finished with some of their changes or they're having issues and I'm not able to actually get at my program. What I was able to do when I ran that, that test now is I'm able to get a, a test, uh, test report here and what I can also do is look at code coverage. So now I'm able to delve into what was actually covered in my test. And Glenn, you, you want to talk a little bit about code coverage? Sure. One of the key values with the key values of code coverage is it gives you an idea of what percentage of your program was actually exercised during a particular test case. And one of the nice things about Topaz for Total Test and those input data stubs and them being easily editable is I can go in and change a particular value. I can look at my code coverage, see what was and was not covered. And when I discover a section that isn't covered, I can look at the logic statements that allow that, date, that code to actually be executed and go back and change my input data to drive the program through a particularly, uh, through a particularly unexecuted piece of code in the program. So why don't we, can we do a quick demo of that, Steve? Sure. So what I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus in as I'm looking through my code coverage. I'm, I'm going to focus in on this paragraph where you can see I have a condition that's not covered and kind of hitting on some of what R Randy talked about in terms of um, in terms of the different structure. So Randy, do you want to talk about some of these types of tests and what this, the value of code coverage can bring to it? Uh, sure, Steve. And the the, the thing about it is it, you, you're showing a perfect example here of, you know, typically what gets missed many times in doing just a typical test of test data or test conditions that we put together. 
And so the traditional view of doing this is that you understand all the conditions, you understand all the decisions and multi-conditions, and you design tests to, to hopefully cover that. The big value here is that you can do it iteratively, and you don't have to have a second tool running someplace else in background monitoring the coverage, which is kind of what a lot of people do with their, their tool sets. And this immediately gives you feedback on what's been covered, what's not. And as you're about to show here, you can then turn the red to green by putting the, the right uh, conditions in to, to hit those lines of code. But, but it, it does give you an understanding of some of those other uh, areas of code that you might have otherwise missed. Yeah, so I'll, I'll focus in on this area, and then if we if we look down through here, you can see there's another area, a fairly large area that's not covered. And in this particular area is something that is only executed at end of month, and that's a that's a really common uh, scenario for a lot of our customers where uh, the, their their mainframe applications that are driving their business are very time sensitive where processing will be done on a particular day, uh, maybe at particular times. In this case, a good example of something that's done at the end of the month that when I ran this, I wasn't uh, hitting this scenario either. So what I'm gonna do is uh, kind of going back to these areas is I wanna, I wanna look at um, this particular area, remember we, we had this condition that wasn't covered, and you, you can see here as I'm going through this with our uh, program analysis capabilities, you can see that you know there's an hourly type, a sales type, all of those are tied to this WA employee type uh, field that's coming from uh, our employee file. So if we look at this employee file, you can see here this employee type, and you can see I only have in uh, valid types, which is good, but I'm not hitting that error condition. So one of the things I can easily do is I can go ahead and modify my stub to hit that error condition. And I could, I, in this case, just for time constraints, I'm just gonna modify this particular stub, but I could also duplicate this stub and add uh, additional stub records to, to force some of those areas that aren't tested. And then the, the other area um, that I can force uh, to be executed is this end of month calculation. And that's controlled ultimately by this, this value that's coming from a, a, a program, this CWBW date program. And I'm not actually executing this program in my unit tests, I've stubbed it out, which makes it really easy for me to force an end of month again in, into the data and make sure I'm covering more of those scenarios. So now I'm gonna go ahead and I'll re-execute uh, again using stubs and collecting code coverage. And if you'll remember previously I had uh, I think about 70% coverage and now what I've been able to do is get that coverage up into the 90s. So right at 90% here you can see I've, I've uh, hit that error condition, and then later on in the program, in the end of month calculation, I'm now executing through that code too. So really, uh, really powerful, and it's very easy for me to run these tests repeatedly. I don't have to go through this orchestration and set up uh, data and worry about what other things uh, people may be doing on the system. I'm able to test in isolation and run those tests very rapidly in a very automated fashion. And that, that helps cut down on my, my mental fatigue, as Randy talked about, <laughs> in the testing process where, you know, after if that's a long and onerous process, it's very easy for me to just say, all right, well, I, I'm, I'm just going to make this change without actually testing it because it's just too hard to do. It's a simple change. And that, that really ends up resulting in a lot of the, the cases um, where we have changes going in that haven't been thoroughly tested, and although the, the developer, you know, really thought that they weren't impacting anything, ultimately there's something that they didn't quite consider, and it causes uh, potentially major 
outages, wrong calculations to occur, et cetera. So using this automated unit test capability, I am, I'm able to really address those challenges. And so I've gotten my code coverage up to 90% from a, a unit test perspective. And now what I want to do is in, in, um, in my development, I'm using ISPW, and you can see here that I have a, a program, and it's at this development level. And what I want to do is uh, move that level up in the life cycle. But what I'm able to do is, as I move it up the life cycle, I have integrated an ISPW back into our uh, continuous integration server, Jenkins. And what that allows me to do is run another set of automated tests that uh, can occur. And in this case, I'll, I'll jump into Jenkins, and you, you can see here that I've triggered a Jenkins uh, process. And what Jenkins allows me to do is run additional testing on it in a very automated fashion. In this case, as I promote up into this, this higher uh, level, I want to take my total test, but this time I'm going to run them without stubs, so I'll run it through a more full functional test and make sure that I haven't broken anything in my regression bed of tests that are set up in a in an automated testing environment. So you can see I've, I've staged uh, data in that environment with file aid. I've executed those tests. I've run it with code coverage. So I'm, again, getting co-coverage metrics, but this time from the automated functional test perspective. And then I've integrated in Sonar Cube into my pipeline and set up a quality gate for uh, the, the project in Sonar Cube. So I'll just jump in the, to Sonar Cube. We can look at what that quality gate looks like from a Sonar Cube perspective. So you can see here I've done some static analysis tests, and I, I don't have any bugs in terms of the code that I've submitted. Uh, there's, you know, a couple things that maybe don't follow coding best practices but aren't bugs. And you can see here I have my coverage metrics also that I'm able to get. So looking into that, you can see that I'm, I'm right at that 90 percentile for the code that I submitted, again, this time from a functional test perspective. Um, so. I have the confidence, and it's built into the process uh, to make sure that the code that I'm submitting is of quality. In a case where maybe, for whatever reason, from bugs or coverage, that this didn't pass, I could set up ISPW to automatically prevent that code from moving up further in the ISPW lifecycle. So, Glenn. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to you to talk a little bit about how um, your perspective on some of this. Sure. So one of the things, well, Randy also mentioned earlier about, you know, the tools, processes, and people slide, and I think this is a really great example of that. In this particular case, the process changed because we added these tools, and it actually reduced the number of people required to run these tests. So, I mean, it, you know, changing any one of those legs of that triangle causes changes in the other aspects of those uh, features, too. So it's really interesting to me that, you know, the introduction of a tool or multiple tools. The other thing to kind of think about is without Jenkins in here, total test isn't as valuable, and without total test, Jenkins isn't as valuable. So there's some real synergies between having multiple products in place. Yeah, and bringing all that technology together um, really helps bring parity to mainframe development from what's done on the distributed side in agile development and being able to shift uh, shift the process left and also have that process more automated. So I'm going to go ahead and stop the screen share at this point. Okay, and here we are in the DevOps tool chain again. This is uh, kind of one of the diagrams that we helps us build uh, flow pipeline flows with our customers, and uh, you know it's really interesting to me. Um, the again we encounter manual unit testing at a lot of our customers, and it's the slowest, most 
time-consuming step of these development processes. Automating the process dramatically speeds up testing because you're not waiting for handoffs, you're not waiting for data sets to be set up, you're not waiting for all of uh, all of the infrastructure around the test environment to be available. So not only does can you test faster, but you can do it when a test person isn't normally available. So if you have limited test systems available, you can be running these tests at night when your test people aren't available. That makes a big difference. It also allows your QA people to spend time looking at creating designing tests and building better tests rather than just repeatedly executing the test manually. That's just such a huge savings. And again, back to test fatigue, we, you know, we've encountered that here when we manually test. After about the third cycle, people are sick to death of looking at a particular set of tests. Key thing I uh, realize with automating execution is it's the ability to automate the creation of the test too. So it's not just good enough to be able to execute the test, but you really need to automate the creation of the test because again, the creation of the test takes a huge amount of time. And if you don't have a test to execute, well, <laughs> you don't have a test to execute. So being able to automatically create those test cases makes a big difference too. And again, we're back to that benefit with cleaner code. If you earlier in the process, you get a cleaner set of code, and that cleaner code follows you throughout the rest of your process. That just makes a huge time savings when you get to things like acceptance testing and uh, integration tests. So it makes better use of your resources later on when you do have live systems available to you. And uh, you know we've run into several customers who have implemented these automatic test frameworks and have really seen the dramatic increase in speed. So one of the other things to talk about it again back is this process. You need to really to do this shift left. It's not just a tooling change and using Jenkins. It's a people change too. People have to have this culture of realizing that they need to test earlier. One of the things we encounter repeatedly is that the culture in a mainframe shop is to wait till the code is done, all the code is done before they actually start executing it. So just like Randy said, you can you can have that lawnmower, you know, mow your lawn in a really ugly way, or you can use the test tools effectively and do tests earlier in your processing. That really makes a big difference. So the process itself makes. Uh, the process itself make, it provides a reminder that that testing is important. And finally, it's good to realize that the, the integration of testing in the broader context really speeds things up. It provides consistency of metrics for code coverage, and it means that you can really compare whether you're getting better or worse in these environments. And again, that level of automation allows you to, the, the level of automation for unit tests allows you to automate the quality gate process too. So once you've got auto more automation in place, it allows you to do even more automation. So there's a huge benefit for that. So I think we're uh, getting close, and we should jump over to the Q&A section now. Just so with that, um, we're going to turn it over to our Q&A here. And we, we do have a, a lot of questions, so I, I think we unfortunately won't be able to hit everyone's questions, but we will, uh, we will touch on some of them. So, uh, the first question is, um, is code coverage automatically captured for every stub that was created? And uh, I'll go ahead and answer that quickly. So when you're running a test, so in the case that I showed, you, we were executing a program that called out to two sub-programs. And you have the ability in total tests to execute that with the stubs, in the case that you're using a stub for a sub-program, it would not actually execute that. So if you recall back to my demo, it showed coverage on the main program and it showed no coverage on the sub-programs because they didn't actually execute, they were stubbed out. So if I did want to execute those sub-programs, I would run that total test without the, the stubs, and that would execute those programs. There is another option to that, Steve. You can actually focus a test on an individual sub-program, too, without calling the main program. So you could target a test specifically to just that sub-program, again, isolating it away from the rest of the system, and that allows you good visibility, and again, you would get code coverage in that scenario. Yeah. In, um, 
There's another question, maybe Randy, you, you could uh, answer this one is, what's the best way to document a test process? Well, that's a <laughs> that, that's a, uh, a a real basic question with a complex answer. However, uh, I, I will give this input that a lot of times they get the question, which comes first, the process or the tool? And I always say you need to consider the process first so that you have a way to control what you're doing with the tool. Um, now, with that said, uh, I – I kind of take a view of process as I would rather have a two-page process that people follow than a two-inch binder that they ignored. So I would start simple. That way it will be less intimidating to anyone trying to use it with the developers. Um, I actually do have a sample unit test workbench uh, diagram and pro tool uh, or process description. Now, it doesn't incorporate uh, total test because it was written before that, but you could easily put that in there. Uh, I take kind of a workbench perspective for that uh, definition. So if you um, go to my website and just uh, send me an email from the website, I'll be happy to send you that a workbench process definition in Word format. And that would probably be my preferred answer. It has checklist in it as well. So having a checklist with your process often helps too, as well as, you know, accommodating for how you're going to use the, the specific okay. tool there. Great. Um, and it, 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 we're running really short on time here, so I think we only have time for one more question. And uh, so the question is, correct me if I'm wrong, automated unit test data is generated by the tool, no program programmer had to create the unit test cases and data. Glenn, you want to answer that? Sure. So the tool actually collects data while the program is running. So the program did originally start with a set of data. We just collected the data that was already being run with that program. And again, now if that's not the data you want to run, once you've collected that data, you can go in and change that. But you didn't have to actually do anything to actually create the test case. You didn't have to do anything to run the test case. That's all kind of baked into the tool. And again, that automated data collection really speeds up the process of getting that test data in place. Great. And uh, so there, there are many questions we didn't get to, and we will definitely be following up with uh, answers to those questions. Again, for additional information, uh, please see the links that are on this slide, and you can gather some more information. And with that, uh, I'm going to turn it back over to you, Janine. Great. Thanks, Steve. Um, note also that those links are live. You can click on those links now and open those um, sites in a separate window. Uh, I want to thank everyone for attending today's webinar, and I especially want to thank Randy, Glenn, and Steve for sharing their expertise with us. Um, watch for a follow-up email uh, later this week. It will contain a link to a recording of today's webinar. That concludes our webinar. Thanks again, and have a great day. <laughs>